Endless Hustles presented by Victory Brewing Company and the Victory Monkeys. Check out Golden Monkey, a smooth 9.5% Belgian triple with notes of banana and cloves. Sour beer is more your thing? Pucker up with Sour Monkey, a 9.5% sour triple with fruity notes from imported Belgian yeast. Delicious 9.5% ABV beers that don't taste like 9.5% beers? The Victory Monkeys just hit different. Check out the Victory Monkeys at victorybeer.com to find Golden Monkey and Sour Monkey at retailers near you. All right, we've got a great day on The Endless Hustles. I'm welcoming friend of the show, recurring guest, Brian Baumgartner. Congratulations. The brand new book, The Oral History of Dunder Mifflin. Anything when I see oral histories of something I love, I'm in. Like Bill Simmons and The Ringer do this all the time. And then when I saw you had the book, I'm like, I'm fucking in. Let's roll. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you. It was uh, it was so so fun uh, to put together and go back and and share uh, well that decade of our lives with uh, so many people that I worked with uh, after seven eight years since we filmed anything. Going back was awesome. So when you start bringing all the cast together and start getting their versions of the stories and them explaining the different moments. What were kind of some of the surprises? What were some of the, the the interesting tidbits that you may have not been aware of that really uncovered themselves through the process? Well, look, I mean, there was there was quite a lot, and and I I really approached uh, the the book and putting the book together as a as an exploration, right? So like very different from like let me tell you how it went through the time on the office and telling stories. I mean. We do tell behind the scenes stories, but really for me, it was about trying to to unpack what happened uh, and why now the show is the most watched show in television today. Like, what are there any clues from what happened in casting or or, you know, bringing on certain certain people in certain key roles? And so for me, um, I was less interested in fact, but more the question of of why this happened and hearing from so many people. So like an oral history is not fact. It is by definition, it is what different people remember. So what we've attempted to do is to put together uh, multiple people's memories. And, you know, that means some things I knew about, but remembered very differently and other things I had never heard about. So one example was the show starts to take off. We start to add cast members, uh, Ed Helms, Ellie Kemper, et cetera. We start getting enormous and NBC goes to, um, co- comes to the producers on the show and says, of course, cause they're a mega corporation. We need to save money. We, we, need, we need to find some ways to save money. Um, and the producers at the time were there. Mike Schur is the one who told me this, this story, but Steve Carell had become a producer and was there and Greg Daniels and, and many of the others. And they said, okay, we need to find a way to save money. And uh, the idea was brought up by an NBC executive that we needed to, to cut some cast members. I mean, it was a show about a dying paper industry with people not doing their jobs all that well. So it would have been logical for some people to have to have been let go and the idea came up from an nbc executive that we save money by cutting some of the cast and steve carell allegedly said no 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 that's not happening and there was silence in the room and the conversation was never brought up again and so the idea at you know, that me sitting in the corner uh, on, on, you know, I had no idea that this conversation, that this was a discussion that happened or that this conversation took place. And, you know, to me, it's a cool story, but to me, it also illustrates how close we had become, what a family we were and how important every single person was uh, as a part of the ensemble to the overall success of the show. So, I mean, look, that's just one of of many stories that I heard of of either funny things that happened or heroic events that took place. But that one obviously for me stands out. I mean, Brian, if you couldn't make Steve any more likable already, 
you pretty much just won him the Nobel Prize right yeah. there. Yeah. Well, and, you know, it's funny, Je uh, Jenna Fisher in our conversation, we were talking about when Steve left and, and Will Ferrell came in. And Jenna says to me, you know, I think that there's this, uh, this uh, competition that's happening in Hollywood between Steve Carell and Will, Will Ferrell of who is the nicest guy. Like, who is the nicest guy to work with and for in Hollywood? And uh, it's true, they both are. And in fact, when I, when I thought of the question, so I didn't start at the very beginning of talking to everybody, but once I thought of the question, I asked everybody about Steve leaving, uh, what was the greater loss to the show? Michael Scott, or Steve Carell. And it's like, it sounds cute. And like, what are you doing? But truly the question was, I mean, Michael Scott was an iconic character, central to the office, obviously. But my point really was Steve uh, Carell was equally a good guy and a leader of all of us uh, behind the scenes. So uh, it was interesting to hear people talk about that. There were so many tidbits in this book as an office super fan myself. There were so many tidbits where I was just like, wow, what if like the one and I'm going to go through a ton of them, but the Kristen Wig casting for Pam. And then there was, of course, the famous SNL skit where when Rain Wilson hosted, he came out and Sudeikis played Jim. But then Kristen Wig was at the desk in Pam's position. And you could see the dichotomy between what Jenna brought to Pam versus what Kristen would have probably brought to Pam. And as great as Kristen Wiig is, listen, she's an A-plus lister and brilliant actress and comedian. It's hard to imagine anyone else being Pam other than Jenna. Yeah, well, there's a lot of discussion about that uh, in the book, actually. Also, that um, I asked, so really Greg Daniels and Ken Quapas, who was the director of the pilot, and and others, um, who was, who, when you saw right away, who was, who was it? Who, who was the person? And I think my expectation was kind of, would be Rain Wilson, right? Like he had achieved um, potentially kind of the, he was potentially the best known person in the cast before actually he had done um, a, a season on Six Feet Under that was very big, especially in Hollywood, whatever that means at the time. And he was, uh, you know, he's just a weird nerd oddball, like seems perfect for Dwight. I think that was my expectation. And really all of them said Jenna, that that as soon as as Greg started talking to Jenna for for him, she was she was it. There was another one that came up that I thought was fascinating, and that was obviously James Spader. Obviously, when he came in as Robert California, listen, replacing Carell and Michael Scott, it's like replacing Michael Jordan, right? Anyone you bring in after, they're not Michael Jordan. Right. Carroll had a great moment, but everyone knew he was a guest star. Robert California had a very polarizing and divided opinion, but it was fascinating because through the book, we see that you guys weren't even that big a fan of what Spader brought to the table. And I thought that was such an interesting take to actually see the internal belief that this may not be working as well. Well, you know, for me, I mean, I'll speak for myself um, because I mean, there is no doubt. And I, and I'm not just saying this, like James Spader is, a I mean, he is he's brilliant. He's, he's he is, brilliant. He's, he is brilliant. I think really what the discussion was, was, do we need somebody else to come in from the outside? Like that, that's really where the discussion came because I think what the expectation was, and, and by the way, I think in, in reality, this is what happened, um, that, that Steve had, and, and part of why he says he left, right? I mean, it's seven years, he's been an enormous movie star. And he, the, he, as Michael Scott had served as sort of the central figure with the most storylines, um, you know, throughout the show. And he, it was, he felt like his story had been told and he wanted a progression and a journey and that he had reached that point. So um, he, he felt like it was time for him to go. And I think what we all thought was, 
well, we now have this established cast here. We now have this established ensemble that we can start hearing from them a little bit more. And again, I think we did. Um, but do, you know, did we need to bring in um, a big gorilla, as I think Paul Lieberstein, you know, did we need a big gorilla and and asked who had just taken did a big gorilla? And I think there was a conversation internally, which was, do we at this point? Like the characters are so well established and and quite frankly loved at that point. What if we what if we focus more energy on getting on hearing more of those stories as a, as opposed to needing to kind of replicate the the structure that existed with with Michael Scott. I also want to talk about Kevin Malone buying the bar at the end because I I didn't realize I it didn't click for me until probably like the third or fourth time that I saw that ending. I was like, how the fuck did Kevin get enough money to actually buy this bar? Not that you could have probably spent 30 million, but you probably got to throw in a couple hundred grand. And I'm guessing Kevin didn't have a couple hundred grand saved, right? But there were alternate ending shot that actually explained that. That blew my mind. Yes. So there was a big uh, chain on Reddit, which essentially the conspiracy theory was that Kevin was a secret genius and had been embezzling money from Dunder Mifflin all along, and that's how he got the bar. But yes, there was a story that was shot, and as I've said to people now, I don't remember, this, this, the series finale was like an hour and 45 minutes, right? Like it was really long. So eventually they started cutting stuff. And the story that was shot was once the documentary, right? So if you stay with me, the, the show that had been being shot by this, PBS crew for nine years. Once that aired, the characters would change and and so it had to be over. And the story is once that aired, Kevin Malone became a fan favorite and became like maniacally popular. And I have t-shirts in my office here that have like weird drawing of Kevin's face. Like Kevin is awesome that like supposedly fans made and so every time Kevin went into a bar, he was offered to a drink from people. There was only so much that a person can consume. So the particular bar that he spent most of his time in, the storyline was he had a, he had um, he had amassed such a credit from the bar that he uh, that was his leverage for uh, becoming an owner or part owner of the bar. So that that's what happened. You were just in Scranton. I mean, you've been everywhere promoting this book, but going to Scranton, I, you're essentially, I wouldn't even say there's cult fame. You're their A-list celebrities. Like the office is to Scranton what Brad Pitt and Tom Cruise are to Hollywood. When you end up going back to Scranton, what is that experience like? Oh, I, I truly, I love the the... I love it so much. And I, you know, Angela Kenzie and I um, were two of the first people that showed up in sort of a official capacity at first. And we were just blown away. I mean, I talk about that trip in the introduction to the book um, where I started to feel like this, something, something is, something's happening um, as Michael would say, but uh, yeah, I, I love it there. I, I love the people. So many have become so, such close friends uh, of mine now. So, you know, when we, you know, everybody goes to New York to, you know, publicize a book and go and you do the Today Show and the this and that and all that's nice. Um, but I, we felt like, well, if we're really going to launch the book the way it should be launched, we've got to go back to Scranton and and one give them the opportunity to celebrate the book with us and 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 and. And, and celebrate with them. So I had Stevie Van Zant on the show a couple of weeks ago. And obviously Stevie was still on The Sopranos, which is my all-time favorite drama show, Amazing. And I asked him what he thought happened to Sill, spoiler alert, even though it's 20 years later, after assuming and after he comes out of his coma after being shot. And Stevie's response was, funny you asked and thank you for asking. I've actually written multiple scripts about that and pitched it to David Chase. And it got me thinking about Kevin Malone was so beloved. 
have you actually taken the time to think through that if NBC or any other network came to you and said, Brian, what do you think Kevin Malone's life is like now? Is there something written, thought out? Do you have the game plan in your head? You know, um, that's a, that is, first of all, that's a genius way to ask the question that everybody asks <laughs> about the office coming back in one form or another. Um, I certainly have thought about it and I my my hope my sincere hope and desire is that he is still like I like to do uh tending bar at his bar in Scranton that's what I hope okay that's a great way to jump around it I love it by the way <laughs> you'd recently and I know it's been news out there but I just saw you talking about it again making a fortune off cameo does it ever get tiresome by the way like are you into it because you love the fans or is it like, holy cow, do I have to record another 2000 messages here? Well, look, I, th this sounds super weird, but I honestly, this is the case because I was, uh, I was hesitant about the platform in the beginning. Here's how I view it now, which brings me joy um, and, and enables me to, to, to truly sort of keep going with it is that, I honestly think that it's not about me. I don't think that, I don't view me sending the messages to people as being about me. What I honestly think that it is, is it is a father whose daughter is now in college or older that used to watch The Office together. And there is, either a birthday or some event or just wanting to make a connection again and using me and those fond memories of the character of the show of whatever to really reconnect together and that's true for adult kids and spouses and girlfriends and their kids and i mean it really goes ac truly across the gamut from age and sex and everything um uh, sex meaning gender, by the way. Um, I, and so I, that's how I view it, that it's, it truly is a, I'm just, I'm just helping to make a connection and it's not really about me. So I try to not make it about me. I try to make it about the two people who are wanting a connection. All of you guys, for the most part, were pretty unknown as you were cast for The Office. I mean, Carell had some stuff going on. As you had mentioned, Rain was probably the most established. Krasinski was like literally a frat boy in college still. But do you ever think about if you wouldn't have gotten that part, and that part has changed your life, I mean, immensely, right? But if you wouldn't have gotten that part, what do you think your life may have looked like? Well, it's funny. I'll tell you a story. Um, when Steve, uh, when Steve left, there was a big party and people were looking for remembrances, et cetera. And Allison Jones, who was the casting director legend, um, she came up to me at this party and she was like, you know, I went back and I was like trying to find some, cause she saves everything. Like I was trying to find something significant to give to Steve, like from the cast, from his original casting process. And she was like, this is what she said to me anyway. She was like, I didn't really find anything that cool, but I wanted you to have this. And it was just a singular piece of paper, clearly very old. I mean, at that point, it was probably eight years, nine years old, sitting in her cabinet. And it was... Uh, it said Kevin Malone, and there were three names that seemed like they were in no particular order. Uh, my name, Brian Baumgartner, uh, Eric Stone Street, and Jorge Garcia. So Eric Stone Street obviously went on to Modern Family, and Jorge Garcia obviously went on to Lost, amongst other things. So I don't know. Who knows? Maybe I would have been on Modern Family or lost maybe that maybe we would have just switched but i'm uh i'm very happy with with how things worked out as i'm sure the two of them are as well i'm actually kind of weighing it in my head a million dollars on cameo or 
Eric Stone Street, Modern Family Money, working with Sofia Vergara. Hmm, which <laughs> one would we take? <laughs> <laughs> when did you find out and how did you find out that you had gotten the part? Um, you know, I mean, now I know that, um, and I don't say this in any uh, disparaging way, Greg Daniels is a genius and he takes his time particularly when he has time. When he has time, he takes his time. Um, but at the time, which is me saying time a lot, I didn't know this. So I, I only met with them once. So I, I only, uh, me, them meaning Ben Silverman, uh, executive producer, Greg Daniels, Ken Quapas, uh, who directed the pilot. And I'm sure everybody weighed in. And I'm also sure now that it was Greg's uh, decision. And I met with them and it was a few weeks. Like, I think I was told they were very interested and, you know, maybe like I knew that it had gotten down to those three or, you know, not, not who they were, but three names or something, but it was a few weeks. And um, yeah, then I just, I just got a call and said that, that I was the guy and probably you're starting to shoot Monday or something. I, I don't really, I don't really remember the details of that, but what I do remember is it being weeks and I really, really wanted it. I really wanted it. And, um, and yeah, that's, I don't know. That's kind of, that's what I remember. Was the Kevin Malone that you put forth in the audition, the same Kevin Malone that we get to see on the show, had you already essentially flushed out those mannerisms and that character and that, that delivery? A little bit. I mean, I think that there there's a progression of all of those things, even once the show started, um, you know, because um, I mean, so the short answer is yes, kind of. But I think that the writers on the show really fell in love with Kevin's uh, childlike uh, sensibility and humor. I'll just put it that way. So that started to increase um, quite a bit. And I actually had struggled as like, you know, an actor who took himself seriously as an actor in creating characters, like how, how to sort of justify what I was feeling as sort of a shift. Um, and I, I have a nerdy justification for this, which is simply that uh, Kevin <clears throat> early on was, very scared of the cameras and the crews that were shooting in Dunder Mifflin. And as he became more comfortable, probably went out for drinks with some of them after work, uh, more of his uh, real personality came out. Man, I would love to see Kevin off camera. The real, <laughs> just pounding shots with college kids in Scranton. It must've been something. <laughs> The other thing that was really interesting about the book was the Jim not cheating on Pam storyline and how Krasinski put his foot down. And it's fascinating because at that point, you guys had such a relationship with the audience that he knew, and I'm sure all of you guys knew, that any significant deviations could turn off the audience. And at that point, you had built so much trust with them that you had to be so careful and and just really making a mockery of it. Yeah, you know, I I I will say this about that that um it kind of what I started this conversation with that it's an oral history. And so I think people remember things slightly differently and the intention of maybe how far things were going to go was different. I mean, I I what's fun, what's crazy is is that I directed uh, one of the episodes that uh, that has been discussed, the episodes after hours, where there was a character while half of the office was on the road, where there was some at least potential for uh, romantic interludes. I don't even know what that means. And what I remember, I don't even remember myself exactly how far it was going to go. I don't remember any direct and specific cheating but what I remember are hours and hours of discussion about how far can we go in this moment how how close can we get how would Jim behave 
um and 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 yeah and not not wanting the fans to feel betrayed or or anything else um and you know greg daniels is very clear from his perspective that um you know through that last season when there's you know when jim goes to philadelphia again that he never intended there to be um you know, on Pam's side with the boom, a specific affair that happened, but it was all about, um, all about, uh, you know, them ultimately coming back and deciding that they wanted the same thing with each other as they sort of always had. So anyway, that's all I'll say about that. I'm not really hedging. I think it's more because there's been a lot of discussion about, about that, uh, that particular storyline. And I, you know, I don't know how far it was scripted to go, um, but yeah, it's, I, I, to me, that's what's all fascinating about it. The, the the core end of it is the same, which is um, we did not want, people did not want to let the fans down. When you create a memorable character like Kevin Malone, it's a gift and a curse. The gift is you get to be on TV for a decade, And you get to have a podcast and do cameos and write books. And you have a career after a career. It's amazing, right? But on the flip side, typecasting is a real thing in Hollywood. When you finished up, was your mindset, hey, I'd like to continue acting. But was there also a fear that people are only going to ever see you as Kevin Malone? You know, I think that's a really good question because I, I uh, I spent several years um, intentionally distancing myself from, from that, partly for the reason that, that you bring up, uh, not wanting to do anything that was quote unquote the same. And, um, I think that what happened was the show, as I've been saying to people recently, the show was big. We were NBC's number one scripted show. I mean, we were a hit, like, let's, I I don't want to mistake that, but we weren't like friends or something, you know, like we weren't like billboard in Times Square and on the cover of magazines like every month, you know, it, it wasn't that. And what has happened is as the show has sort of taken off again and, and even bigger than it was before to now be the most watched show of any show on television, um, I have that question has interested me. And I was like, okay, let's stop running from the guy. Um, Let's just have Brian examine this and the story because the business was always interesting to me. And um, it's, it's, Kevin exists and Kevin is there and I will always and for all time be Kevin. Um, But I decided it it was time to stop, to stop running from him and, um, and really, and really get in there to try to find the root of what happened. Great answer, man. Well, congratulations. The new book is called The Oral History of Dunder Mifflin. Anybody who is a fan of The Office should read this because it is freaking awesome, man. And congratulations oh. on everything you've been able to do since since the end of the show. And you're always a wonderful chat, man. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks, Cheers. Brian. Have a great Have a great Thanksgiving. Thanks, you too. Take care, brother. All right, bye-bye.